Yeah, amen. Hi, everybody. How are we doing tonight? How are you doing tonight? <laughs> I'm here. Excellent. Thanks for bringing my chair. You're welcome. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. So if you didn't get our email, Janice, oh, hot mic. <laughs> I know I wanted to say it before you did. <laughs> so, this is Mike's favorite joke, if you didn't know that. <sighs> I wasn't even talking. I know. Yeah. I know. All right. You're just like magnetic. Ooh. Ooh. Um, only, so, to, only to you, babe. So we're not asking that question to shame you. We're actually asking that question because we shared some very exciting news. So um, as we all know, we've had some disruption over the last few weeks, the last month with our church services, I guess the building where we uh, previously were meeting is still has a good portion of it wrapped in plastic and being dried out and rebuilt. Um, so the we've made some really exciting decisions, right? Yeah. I messed up your computer. You did, I was just trying to get it lighter. I can't see it. It's so dark. Oh, there's the brightness. Ooh. I got you. So what's, what's so exciting? All right. So we, uh, uh, we, Josh, who's the pastor here at the porch, as many of you know, used to be on staff at Smoky Hill Vineyard a few years ago. And, um, uh, obviously, most of the staff with, with uh, for SHV has long history with them, but actually, uh, Christy and I have had long history with Josh even before we came back and started working at SHV again. And so, just having conversation with Josh over the last few weeks and, and some time this week, he has, we've agreed to stay here through the end of next year minimally. Woo-hoo. So, we are locked in here through the end of December of next year. So, if you're not comfortable, settle on in, get yourself comfortable, okay? Yeah. Uh, we're really excited. Like Janice yeah. mentioned, it gives us the opportunity to immediately open Hope Starts Here Food Bank. We've been in conversation around how we could do that here at the porch, um, even without us meeting here, but it just solidifies everything and moves it fast forward, right? You know, when you look at me, you don't echo. Oh, should I just hang with you? Yeah, like, that's yes. exactly, yeah. Right. So that's, that's really exciting, and we're so thankful to Josh. We're thankful for the porch church. Um, to, to make space for us. And, you know, it's, it's interesting the way God works sometimes. He, he opens one door and he, you know, while he closes another. And so, uh, super thankful that the Lord worked that out so quickly and we didn't have to, like, wander around in the wilderness for 40 years, right? Yeah. So, right, all right. I am thankful for that. Yes. All right, so tonight we're kicking off our new series, Life Abundant, Life Abundant. And um, I had this interesting quote that I came across this week that I felt like, This is how we're supposed to start our message. This is from a spiritual formation pastor on the East Coast, and she says, week after week, good church people come to me with their R-rated lives and a question. Does God's presence in me really change anything? In the midst of the busy, scattered, exhausted, and hurting lives, we want to experience a great love with God. Desire and desperation gnaw at our hungry souls, and we want to know if God will show up for us. Hmm. Maybe this resonates for you. It certainly resonates for us in our journey as pastors and followers of Jesus. Um, There are different seasons of all kinds of things. Maybe you're longing for something more in your own life, in your own relationship with God. Maybe the idea of loving God is very foreign to you. Maybe you're desperate for something in your own life to change. Maybe a sin pattern, maybe a uh, relationship, family systems dynamics, behavior. Maybe your life, you look at your life and you think, gosh, my life looks a lot more like Game of Thrones or Modern Family than it does Mother Teresa or Fred Rogers, right? Maybe Mr. Rogers, right? Maybe. Perhaps you're confused as to why You can't stop drinking. You can't stop giving in to temptation. You linger too long on a a part of a movie or a show or something on the internet that you should not be entertaining. Maybe this thing of an R-rated life really hits home, right? Are you turning that on and off? I'm trying to make sure you don't echo. Are we echoing that bad in the room? A little bit? We're going to get one. When I turn turn off, you don't echo. (laughs) Yeah, but then we can't banter. How fun is that? You didn't didn't give me space to talk here for like another five minutes. Okay. Well, then we'll just turn this off. (laughs) No. Okay.
Okay, but this is what Jesus has to say about that type of situation, that type of reality in this culture that we live in. Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30 says, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. This is the essence of our heart for this next series. Come away and you'll recover your life. I will show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me, work with me, watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Isn't that beautiful? The unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Who doesn't want that more in their lives, right? Maybe I'm the only one burdened. Everyone's like, we're fine. I don't know. You're fine. No, I want more. Oh. So over the character studies that we've been doing of Ruth and Esther and Jonah, we've considered what does it look like to be different than the world, right? To bless those who persecute us or yell at us, to be full of compassion, to be full of faith, to be fearless, to be full of repentance, to be peacemakers, not peacekeepers, right? But the question that we want to pursue now is this idea of how are we actually made different? How are we made different? Would you describe your life this very day, would you describe it as life abundant? I remember last week you said, we don't expect people who don't know Jesus, or we shouldn't expect people who don't know Jesus to act like they do. They shouldn't live differently. We shouldn't expect the world and people who are in it to look any different. But as followers of Jesus, where are you in your journey? How are we standing in the midst of a world and looking different? How do we actually do that? Yeah, I think think what's hard about that is that even people who are followers of Jesus don't act that like they are following Jesus. It's like hard. Yeah. It is hard. Yeah. So true. So we're going to talk some about some of the kind of Christian fundamentals of the faith. And when we start thinking about things like spiritual practices or spiritual disciplines, um, they can create all kinds of weird angst in us. So um, if you've ever had some history with being involved with uh, other church kind of um, uh, denominations or even other groups, as we get into these places, it becomes really easy for these things to start to become religious to start to become checklists, to start to become have-tos. So what are practices and why would we practice? Well, David Benner in his book, Desiring God's Will, says spiritual disciplines, I'm sorry, spiritual disciples should always be, no, it should be disciplines. Spiritual disciplines should always be a means to a spiritual ends, never ends in themselves. They are places of meeting God that do not have value in and of themselves. I want to say that again. They do not have value in and of themselves. They are places of meeting God. To treat them as if they did is to develop a spirituality that is external, self-energized, and legalistic. So to be really clear, we are not asking or inviting into that. Our hope as we enter this series, Life Abundant, is a few things. One is that maybe we help you rethink spiritual practices. Maybe we help you engage with some that maybe you've never tried before. Maybe you try something you've not tried before and you like it and you really find and meet God there. Maybe you have like a little hang up around the word disciplines and maybe we'll help you find freedom in that or healing. Yeah, and I had a great conversation this week with another pastor friend of mine and, uh, and we were having this conversation around the, one of the flaws of church. So I'm just, I'm just going to confess one of the flaws of churches. I have seen it in my <clears throat> 50-something years of following Jesus or whatever it is. So one of the flaws I have seen in church is that church is a whole bunch of what you should be doing and telling you all the ways you're missing God. Can anybody resonate with that? Like you're constantly told, well, you should be doing this and you should be doing that. And if you're not doing this, then you're not really following Jesus. And if you're not, what up, blah, 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 blah. That's a bunch of garbage, by the way. That's not the Jesus that I've encountered. What's fascinating is I think we have missed it as pastors and as churches. 
We've spent a lot of time helping people think through how to shape their lives rather than celebrating the places where they are gaining and growing. So what would it look like to enter into some practices going, yeah, I'm going to try this, and if it doesn't work, I'm going to go, yeah, not going to try that one again, right? Because there are benefits. There are actually benefits of life with Jesus that he wants to invite us into. And for us to think, well, it's got to be this way because that's the way it's always been, I think we're missing the fullness of who God is. So as we enter into this season, let's start thinking in terms of benefits, what we stand for, not instead of corrections, what we stand against, right? It's part of what I talked about last week, that we as the people of God should be people who stand for something. Let's stand for life with Jesus. Let's take some chances. Let's take some risk. Let's try some things. In fact, I will tell you as we lay out these different things we've asked the staff to teach on, these different disciplines, we actually would not let anybody take one they're already good at. Yeah, which has been really fun because if we're leading through a series of what are these historical practices, we have to be growing and learning ourselves. And so we all went, oh, you're real good at that. You can't have that. Yeah. I mean, literally, it so literally was a we fun asked conversation. Them, we asked Candace, and we asked Greg, and we asked Amelia. And what, which one are you the worst at? Which one is making you cringe? Yeah. And they which were one like, right now, you're like, your knees are knocking a little bit. That's your one. Yeah. yeah. Because we're asking them to try it and try some different things. Us too, Us by too, the way. Us too, by the way. Yes. Us too. Yes. They told us which ones we needed. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> but you'll see that later in the series. As we go into these, a couple ground rules. One. This is not an invitation to try everything. Or it could be. If the Lord knows. Pause for a second. (laughs) I'm just saying. Let me rephrase that. The question is. Can we mute her for a minute? what (laughs) What is the Lord inviting you into? This is not a requirement to try everything. Yes, good way to put it. It's an invitation to try something. Yeah. Okay? So try something. And. One of the beauties of following Jesus is that it should be constantly growing and changing and transforming to try something different that you haven't tried before. None of these things are God themselves. They are ways in which hopefully we can grow in our understanding of who God is for us. Okay? I think David Benner's perspective on that is so healthy that nothing can be an end, no discipline, no practice, even if we're great at it, even if we're not real great at it, none of it is an end in and of itself. It's to create the space and to increase the opportunity for that abundant life to be experienced in our own journey of faith. So So we have titled this message specifically for today, Invitation into Life Abundant. So we want you to see this as an invitation. What's God's invitation week after week? What's he inviting you into? And I will promise you that what it will be for you will be different probably from the person you're sitting next to. And maybe the person sitting in front of you or behind you to allow yourself to find new ways and new rhythms that you might discover. Okay? So we're going to pray. We're going to dive in. We're actually going to hit some scripture. Okay? Promise you that. So we're going to go to John 10. And um, let's pray and then we'll dive in. Would you like to pray? Yeah. All right. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to just say yes to anything that you put in front of us for this next season. We just say, Lord... We anticipate that you have come, that we might experience abundant life, and we want to respond wholeheartedly. So God, I pray that you would, as we um, even gather together, as we consider this journey, this adventure of this next series, that you would birth in us and, and just breathe on us the things that you've placed in our hearts, God, the things that you desire to bring new life out of each one of us. And we just say, Holy Spirit, have your way in us. May we not return the same. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we are going to look at John 10. And before we do that, I want to, because John 10, 10 is going to be kind of our main verse that we're going to be working this whole series off of. But I want to, you can't look at John 10, 1 through 10 without looking at John 9. It's so important. The context really matters. And what's beautiful about this text is it actually hits the very thing we do not want to do where we do not want to be Pharisees. We don't want to add things to you. We're not trying to wear you down or, or the woes that Jesus gives to the Pharisees where he says you add all these things to the people. Yeah. We're not, this is not the goal. So we want to be really clear. So John 9 is this beautiful story of, it's the one where Jesus spits in the dirt, right? And heals the guy who's been blind. And then I what, thought about doing an illustration of that, but. 
Thanks. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe, to, maybe. So uh, we're out of drama series, remember? Oh, that's right. So, so, uh, so Jesus heals the guy, and he, has, he spits in the dirt, and he heals the guy, and the guy runs off and tells everybody he's been healed, right? So he gets called in front of the Pharisees. Do you remember this story? He gets called in front of the Pharisees. The Pharisees are, like, yelling at him. Why, why would this guy must be a sinner if he healed you in the Sabbath? Do you remember the story now? And the guy goes, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know if he's a sinner or not. And they go, well, who is he? And he, goes, is he, he can't be from God. And he, the guy goes, hey, look, I don't know. I couldn't see before. I can see now. Boom, right? I mean, it's really fascinating. And then these guys are like, well, can you tell us who it is? And he goes, why, do you want to follow him? And it's really funny. So then they, they weren't so excited Yeah, they weren't that. so excited about that. They kick him out of the synagogue, right? They pretty much kick him out of church for getting healed. So this is what's really interesting about this story, too. If you think about this guy, he, didn't, he literally had never seen Jesus. This was a blind man who then got covered in mud and told to go wash. He never set eyes on Jesus. And as he's called before the Pharisees, who is this man? He's like, legitimately, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I've never even seen this guy. If you think he's a sinner, I mean, that's on you. Here's what I can tell you. I know. Yeah. Talk about witness, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. I don't know. I couldn't see before. I can now. If you want to follow him, great. Go for it. Yeah. So we've, we pick up the story in John 9, 35, all right? So when Jesus heard what had happened, this guy's been kicked out of the synagogue. He found the man and asked, do you believe in the Son of Man? This is fascinating, right? The man answers, who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. Right, because he's not even seeing <laughs> Jesus He's not even seeing Jesus, Jesus yet. This is his first moment actually seeing Jesus. Before we go past that, though, can we, like, call out the fact that Jesus, in the most desperate place, this man has been literally thrown out of everything, his family, his society, his culture, his church, and Jesus hears about it and goes to him. Isn't that beautiful? It's one of my favorite parts of that story. Yeah. It just means that he doesn't hold with the religious stuff. Yeah. He just, he won't do it. And, he, and he'll actually come and meet you in spite of all that stuff, right? Yeah. He comes, anyhow. So the man answers, who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. And Jesus goes, you've seen him. Boom. This is on the man. And he is speaking to you, right? Because this is how the guy would recognize people is through voices. And the, and, there's, and the guy says, yes, Lord, I believe, the man said, and he worshiped Jesus. Then Jesus told him, I've entered this world to render judgment, to give sight to the blind, and to show those who think they see they are blind. I want you to hear that line again. I've come to this world to give sight to the blind and to show those who think they see that they are blind. Hey, there is so much blindness that Jesus heals throughout his ministry and most theologians believe that it has to do with a physical representation of the spiritual blindness of the people and the leaders of Israel. The particular the religious leaders were spiritually blind. So, verse 40, some Pharisees who were standing nearby heard him and asked, so they're following him around, right? They asked, are you saying we're blind? So, this is the moment where I, sarcastic Mike would have said if the boot fits, right? But Jesus is nicer than me. He says, if you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty. Boom but you remain guilty because you claim to see. So as we head into the next thing that he shares out of John 10, 10, you have to realize it comes on the heels of this very conversation. All these people are still standing around listening to what Jesus now says next. So Jesus is not just inviting us into life. He's actually telling us this whole religious thing won't work. It won't work. It brings death. And there's such a dichotomy here because the Pharisees are really trying. Like, they're really trying. And so I, like, I, I see that and I go, man, they were working really hard. There's like some compassion that bubbles up in me. Like, oh, man, they were trying the hardest have, of anybody. I, I know, you don't have that. I have zero. I know. But they were spiritually blind. They were working hard for their own purposes. They were. Yeah. That's true. They were claiming yeah. insight. They were essentially what Jesus warns about, the false shepherds, the ones who are adding the things to the word of God. And so when they took these good hearted intentions, but then they became legalistic rules or you must do this, you must not do this. If you walk this way, if you touch this, you know, like all these crazy things. And um, they required people to jump through a lot of hoops, right? A lot of, a lot of things. They used fear, they used intimidation, and they used rules. But what's interesting about the Pharisees is they used them for their own benefit. They wanted a really clear line that said who's in, who's out. And we've talked about this before, about centered set theology versus circle set. So circle set says, you are not in, I am in. I'm in the circle. Center set says the cross, Jesus is in the middle, and those move, they're in every direction, people moving towards the cross and people moving away. Center set says, I don't, there is no circle. Are you moving towards Jesus? Is there movement closer to the Lord? 
And so the Pharisees are looking for really clear, like, wait, but are you in or are you out? This might sound familiar. There are lots of people who still like to do that today. But Jesus is giving them a true spiritual lesson in John 10. He's knocking the righteousness right out of them, right? Talk about knocking the wind out of their sails. Yeah. By the way, has anybody ever been in a church where it's all in and out? Are you in or are you out? Not like the good burgers. Yeah, not like Like the burgers, circle right? yeah, where you either that. are in yeah. crowd or out crowd. Yeah, we just, by the way, Smoky Hill Vineyard, here's our promise to you. As long as we're involved in this church, we're going to be people who are looking for those who are moving towards Jesus. We're going to to define what only God can define. Okay? That's our promise to you. That's right. We'll try our best, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Because we don't want to be Pharisees. That, <laughs> yes. Okay, so Jesus, what he's doing here is contrasting the Pharisees and their responses, their accusations, their going after what they think is the truth with the man born blind, right? So John 10, 1 through 5 says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They'll run from him because they don't know his voice. What a beautiful picture, right? Yeah, so the, the context of this is that in this day, in this time of the, of the world, in this place in the world, sheep were kept in pens at night. Typically, they were kind of stone-walled in, and they would bring them all in at night to keep them safe from other animals and predators, uh, from thieves, from robbers, those sorts of things. And the idea is, is that there was somebody who would be paid to watch, usually more than one flock in this penned-in area at night. And then the shepherd would come get them in the morning, call, and only their sheep that know that shepherd's voice would follow of them out of the pen, and they would go off for their day and go munch around and find places to eat. And in the Old Testament, Israel will often describe hearing God's voice as this idea of obeying his, his laws and his messages. And those who were truly his sheep, those who were in covenant relationships, and this language of shepherd and sheep was used a lot. What's really fascinating is that often in the Old Testament, many of the leaders were former shepherds right? Think about it. Moses was a shepherd. David was a shepherd. Abraham was a shepherd. And, um, and they were often called shepherds over Israel, not just shepherds over their specific flocks. And actually, Psalm 23 is one of the, the greatest examples, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. This idea that, that even seeing God as the shepherd, as the true shepherd, the one that would take care of the sheep. So then we go to the rest of John 10. And so the, this, Jesus gives this little analogy those who heard Jesus use his illustration didn't understand what he meant. So he explained it to them. I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers. He is specifically talking to religious leaders who have not been caring for the flock. But the true sheep do not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come through me will be saved. We talked about this last week. There is no other name in which you'll be saved. Jesus, period. They will come and go freely and will find good pastures. The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. So beautiful. Other translations, of course, say, and life in abundance, right? That's what Jesus came to do. And I, I look at this and I think, how offensive this must have been. Like, these are the guys who really are trying as the religious leaders, as those going, like, let's do this, right? To be called thieves and robbers, and if the he called fits. them all kinds of things, actually. Yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah, guilty I'm sinners. I mean, this is a significant spiritual lesson. Yeah. And I think we see that sometimes they missed it. They missed it. Those who heard Jesus missed him. And in their blindness, they could not understand and see Jesus as the Lord and the shepherd. They saw all of their power going away, all of their influence, all of the things that they worked so hard to set up just being demolished, right? So again, Jesus is taking this pharisaical response and he's contrasting that with this sold out nature from the former blind, formerly blind man, right? He says, yes, Lord, and he worshiped him all in, right? He is just sold out. Who does that remind you of? Someone please tell me the Ninevites. You remember we just came out of that series, right? I'm just saying, 
sold out. Lord, yes. Yeah. All right. So here's my question, because I think there are lots of us in the church who have studied under people or um, sat under people who maybe are a little bit like the Pharisees. And as we get into this whole thing of life abundant, I do believe the Lord wants to bring healing for some of us who have seen ill behavior, misbehavior in the church by church leaders. Um, it's unfortunately not that uncommon. I remember, um, and, and I say that because I want you to pay attention as we're previewing kind of what this series is going to be about. If you're like, oh, no, I don't, do th- I don't do that because of that. Pay attention to those things if they rise up right? I remember um, studying under this woman, and she was, she was incredible, I thought, and she was full of, like, I am such an incredible prayer, and she, like, I mean, just astounding, like, to see what she would hear from the Lord, and years later, I remember going through this um, training on prayer and just realizing, oh my goodness, this was actually self-exhortation. This wasn't, I, this was really for her own feeling of importance, was kind of what the Lord helped me sort, because I'm like, my prayer life sucks, Like, honestly, that's what I left with was, I'm really bad at this. And as the Lord kind of unpacked that, like, where does that come from? Where is that false belief? And I realized there were things being put on me that I went, oh, that's not how he's made me. Trying to put that on me would be like trying to put on someone else's armor. For example, when David put on Saul's armor to go fight Goliath, right? And it didn't fit. And it wasn't right. And the Lord went, no, I've made you a very certain way. And so as, you, as we talk about disciplines and practices, if you have those things come up, resistance, resonance, we always say God is in the resistance. Yeah. I say that. I say that actually. Yeah, you do. I don't know that you All the time. love that. Yeah. Yep. God is in the resistance. So do not run. When resistance comes, it's actually a different type of invitation. So pay attention to those things. And as you have them rise up, let's see what the Lord wants to do in our midst, right? Remember the words of David Benner. Disciplines are not an end in and of themselves. We're not going to make you superhero Christians. Nope. You checking off every single box, like I did every single one in that series. I'm amazing. Nope. There Nobody are, gets a no gold, gold star. star. Yep. No <laughs> yeah. gold stars. No gold stars. We're right there together. Got, that yeah. Yeah, well hey. done. Yeah. Oh, we missed. Um. <laughs> you got to look at the elbow. Okay. Whatever. Jesus is the end goal, right? The disciplines are in our lives. These historical Christian faith practices are there and have been so fruitful forever because it allows us a space to carve out for God's presence to come and encounter us, transform us, set us free, heal us from the things that maybe have been misconstrued in our journey. Oh, I'm so excited for this series. All right. (laughs) I am. Okay, we also see in this section the Pharisees acting like what Jesus calls them, thieves and robbers. And what does that mean to be a thief and a robber in the kingdom? That's what I was thinking about. And I found this great, um, I actually have a few books if you're interested. There's this book by Nathan Foster. You might recognize the name Richard Foster, right? He was the one who wrote um, Celebration of Disciplines, and uh, like he's incredible. Well, Nathan is his son, and he has this really accessible book talking that's called The Making of an Ordinary Saint. And I love it because it's just, it's like funny. It's his, I should probably do what my dad, you know, spent his whole life sewing into. And it's his journey of trying on the spiritual disciplines. But this is what he says. Unfortunately, this is part of his motivation for doing this journey himself in his own life. To, he took a whole year and he set it aside and said, I'm going to spend this year dedicated to pressing into this particular group of disciplines that his dad has written about. He says, unfortunately, our religious culture expects people to automatically be well established when they come into faith. As a result, good people with good intentions who desperately want to do the right thing end up faking the spiritual life, pretending they have things together or just hiding who they really are, all because they either don't have the tools or they haven't put in the years. And by that, he means the the long year over year over year faithful discipleship. He really has a heart to say this this isn't a... nine-week thing. This isn't a nine-year thing. This is a lifetime journey of sanctification. 
He doesn't say that all here, but I'll summarize for you. So either they don't have the tools or they haven't put in the years. Rather than our churches becoming places where people can be open and vulnerable about their journeys, where people can work towards spiritual growth, they so often become some of the most dishonest and disingenuous of gatherings. Saints, we do not want to be those people, Mm -mm. right? We have worked very hard to go, we are honest. Obviously, you get get us, you get us. And um, we have really worked with our team to go, this is not some superstar sport. Mm -hmm. We are all journeying arm in arm, linked together towards spiritual growth all of the days of our life, right? Yeah, I actually had a guy in my in my early twenties tell me, "Fake it till you make it." And I went, "In your church?" Yeah, Gah. I know, right? Yeah, I just as you were reading that, I, that all came back. We, we, the we'll, Lord wants to bring healing. Oh, yeah. It is available. Yeah, I think I'm past that point. I've forgotten about it. So yeah. yeah. So let's go back to this idea of the good shepherd. And so I want to go back to ten four. John 10, 4, okay? Uh, John, where Jesus is taught on the, the analogy of the shepherd, he says, and he, after he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them and they follow him because they know his voice, right? So a shepherd would go into the pen, the sheep that know his voice would then follow him out. And what's fascinating about even the way this language is, is after he has gathered his own flock, the word there is, it's also the word, same word for brought out. The word, this is the same root word that was used when they described the way the Pharisees threw the blind man out of the church, the formerly blind man out of the synagogue. This powerful moment where you go, man, Jesus is so amazing that he even used the same root word for the way that they kicked this guy out of church. He's going, but I'm going to use it as a way of inviting you out into life with me. It's beautiful, I think. So just a little nugget there for you. So when, um, uh, then he goes forward towards the fields, sheep following him, and the sheep would run away from a stranger. It's basically saying, you are my smelly sheep is what he's saying. Later on in John 10, on a, in a totally different story, it's a, a different moment completely, uh, Jesus says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me, for my Father has given them to me. He is more powerful than anyone else. No one can snatch them from the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. So what I want you to think about as we head into these practices, I used the word earlier, an invitation. This is an invitation. Maybe part of the invitation is hearing God's voice a little bit better, a little bit more clearer. I know that one of the things that I I consistently have people wrestle with is, how do I know that's God speaking to me and not the lasagna I had for lunch, right? Or whatever it is. And what I want to encourage you is, is that spiritual practices are not God's voice. But spiritual practices can help us hone in on God's voice. And I do think that we can find some different practices that will allow us to go, yeah, that feels true to who Jesus is in my life. And so I want you to think about, even as we head into some of these practices, maybe this is an offer and an invitation for you to refine even your hearing God's voice and what that looks like. I know that for me, when I feel like God starts to speak to me with something, I balance that with what does the Scripture say? Am I, is he asking me to do something that's way out of line with what he would ask me to do as a part of Scripture? Is it also go out of line with what it's the group of community he's put me in to live life with? And, and so I can balance all those things together. But what I want to encourage you as you think about this invitation piece is going, man, maybe, maybe it would be even more fun or more life, or more abundant life, to go, I am really hearing God's voice clearly, or clearer than I had before. So maybe that might be a part of the invitation. Do you guys remember before caller ID existed, which I know is a stretch for some, but like a long time ago, and you would have a new friend at school, and you get their home phone number, and you'd call them, right? And you weren't sure when they answered, like, is that them? Is that their sister? Is that their mom? Like, Right? But the more you talk to them, the more you learn their voice. And then you would know when they picked up, like, hey, can I talk to so-and-so instead, right? You knew it wasn't them on the phone. That's the same thing that I was thinking about as we learn God's voice, as we experience that familiarity. 
as we go, oh God, I know it's you, it's not lasagna. Yay, right? It's exciting. The other piece that we want to just challenge everyone is these practices are to be done in community. So we are all going to do this together, okay? So I want you to look at your neighbor, okay? We're not going to say anything, so you're okay. Just take take a glance at who's around. Don't be freaked out. We're fine. Hi. Hi. Um, So I am going to give us permission to ask one another, how is this going for you? Gently, lovingly, how's this going? Are you enjoying this? Has this been hard for you? We are not looking to create disingenuous, performing people. What we want to do is say, man, I am honestly loving this, or I am honestly struggling with this. This is very hard to put into practice in my life, right? This is your community. This is where together we get to grow forward. This is exciting stuff. There are Christians around the world who are following Jesus and have no opportunity to do this sort of thing. They don't have the opportunity to stand next to one another and look at one another and go, how is this going for you? Let's not miss that opportunity, right? Yeah, maybe we could even ask the question, how can I be praying for you as you're processing the practices? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And we just want to remind you, the family of God, it's not a theory. This is legitimately what the word says over and over and over again. Ecclesia is the gathering of God's people, the oikos and the, um, I'm forgetting the other one right now, uh, Adelphoi is the family, the brothers and the sisters of God. And it shows up, those words, those references to the family of God show up four times as much as the gathering. So this is important, but that eye on eye contact that says, how is this going for you is the most important thing, okay? All right, so let's relook at John 10.10. We're going to look at it out of um, ESV version. And this is what the whole series, this life abundant, is focused on, okay? How do we have more life with Jesus? How do we learn to grow even more in hearing his voice and knowing who he is answering the phone? How do we have life abundant, right? The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. The enemy is not creative. Over and over again, you know, we talk about the past behavior is the best predictor of future behavior, unless there's some remarkable, miraculous intervention that comes, right? Something divine, something practiced, something intentional, okay? The the enemy is just not creative. But Jesus, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus came that we might have life abundant. Okay, so these spiritual disciplines, these practices, these things that we get into, they usher in abundance. They usher in abiding in obedience. They usher in a learning stance and heart before the Lord. I like learning, so I don't know about you, but I started about two years ago, I started this learning cohort with a bunch of, um, actually a bunch of leaders I don't even know. And every quarter we go away to Chicago and we go to a Catholic seminary and we spend three days in this rhythm of community and solitude, silence and confession, silence and group spiritual direction and these beautiful teachings and, and practicing these sort of things, right? And one of my friends had done it a couple years before I had, and, and I said, hey, Dee, I'm thinking about doing this. And she goes, oh, this was the most impactful thing I've ever done for my spiritual journey. And I was like, "Mm, okay. Like, I'm emotive, right? You know me. I'm a little emotive. And I was like, you're being a little over the top. Like, you're way more emotive than I am, right? And about three quarters in, I had to go back to her and repent and confess because I was like, she was right. So my heart for our family, for our churches, is that the Lord would open up an invitation in this series, in this thing, for something new, for some element where you go, I did not want to do that. I did not want to learn how to turn off my phone for three days and be quiet. I'm also a talker. You know that. This was very hard for me. I also have rest later in this series, so I'm just saying there are things about what the Lord put me in. He's like, hey, 27 months of learning how to do this better. I'm like, okay, that's uncomfortable. But here's the thing. I 
truly had to go back to her and go, you were right. I thought you were being ridiculous, and you were right. And so I am so excited for our churches as I go, what is the Lord going to do as he sows into us in this time? That's the invitation. That's why I'm so excited. Because we can say yes and worship him, just like the formerly blind man. Yes, all in. Yeah, okay, so here's the good news. Shannon's mentioned this. We're going to go through this whole series, okay, this cool graphic that he did. Every week, we're going to add a new practice to our repertoire, to our palette, if you're an artist, to Ooh. we're going to add a new color, and we're going to stick with that for that period of time. At the end of the entire series, we've been working on this beautiful, interactive, like how can you engage with each practice? So we're going to go through it over the next eight weeks, and then we'll have... Seven weeks. Worth of- well, there's a, there's a Selah week. A Selah? Right? Do you know what Selah means when you read through Psalms and then all of a sudden it says Selah? Selah. I'm like, what is that? It's where you're... Isn't that a Christian band? No. Okay. Well, I mean, it might be. But in the Word of God, <laughs> it's where we're supposed to stop and not rush out of it. Yeah. We're supposed to remember and be present to what the Lord has done. So we'll do a final week of Selah as well. Selah. Selah. Yeah. Um, and so what we're going to do, though, is we have this incredible book that once we're done with all of the practices, we're going to s- send the whole community out with this book that we can go through and be reminded and try them out and journal through it and what is the Lord speaking? What am I learning? So you get to try it out a little bit, and then we're going to go even deeper in your own personal time as we move to the end of the series, okay? Remember, invitation, yes. not requirement, right? Okay. What is God's invitation each week? What is he inviting you into? Not what do you feel this thing I have to do because you think it looks cool or other people are doing it, right? Not all the cool kids are doing it. I promise you. There's lots of these practices I won't do. And where is God? Let me rephrase that. I haven't done yet. (laughs) Where is God? Where is God and what's the invitation? No, no, no. Where is God? He's in the resistance. Yeah, that's what you keep saying. I know. (laughs) We're going we're gonna to get comfortable in that, so let's, too. Let's give you but. some broad strokes of these practices. So the first practice will be prayer. And it will be lots of different kinds of prayer. It will be different ways in which we can engage in prayer. You will be fascinated to know that I, I think we have at least seven or eight different ways of thinking through how to do prayer. And so maybe it's a different model of prayer for you that you could try out even for that week. We're going to talk about the breadth of what we see between community all the way to solitude, community only with the Lord. What is the, the kind of whole scope of what God designed for his body to be together and to retreat just with him, just as Jesus did? Yeah, because you need both. You do need others, but you also need time alone with the Lord. So some of you extroverts, you need to go be quiet. And some of you introverts need to be with people a little bit more. You so need to be a little, a little louder. Bit. So yeah. we'll hit you both. Don't you worry. So then we're going to take on Scripture and the study of Scripture. We actually invited our friend Danielle Reeves in to do the one on Scripture. We decided that anybody on our team would be a little unfair to be the person coming in and talking about. But that does not mean that Danielle is not qualified to talk oh, about that, incredible. just to be real clear. She's incredibly qualified. But, <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, we wouldn't give anybody on our team one they're really yeah. good at, is they what you're saying. They couldn't have an out. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So she's going to come in and do Scripture. And then we're going to talk about fasting. And by the way, going back to Scripture, there's lots of different ways to ingrate engage with scripture. That's one of our hopes is help you think about some of the different ways to engage. Yeah. Um, Fasting, which includes things like eating and drinking. It could also include things like electronics or the news or any social media, right? Fantasy football. Nope. Wait. Yep. Maybe (laughs) if the Lord speaks it, let it be. At at least from, God is in the resistance. (laughs) Monday night through Thursday afternoon, right? I mean, yeah. It so. might be around sobriety. It might be around <laughs> simplicity. It might be around waiting or abstinence and chastity. Yeah. And then we're going to take on forgiveness, confession, repentance. Uh, you know, the, the small three, as I call them. You know, the, the little ones, right? Right. And we're, we're going to talk about rest. And we're going to talk about Sabbath and God's beautiful design for Sabbath. I mean, that's an easy one, right? I, I love Sabbath. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I struggle a little bit with the slowing, the right. unplugging, the waiting. Let's do the last one. We'll the explain same. a little bit more about that one. Yeah. So the last one we're going to do is time, treasure, and talents. So this picture of what has God given you from a 
from a personality standpoint, from a gifts mix, from a resource thing, what well, not just necessarily financially, but even also maybe you have time available that others don't have, then how are we taking those things and then submitting them to the Lord? And what's that look like? Uh, and it will be kind of across the board. It won't be just a, by the way, this is not a giving message or a serving message. It's a, how do we find our true identity piece and who God made us to be, and then have those things be an expression of who he might invite us into more of. So, and then we'll wrap up the last week with our Selah. Selah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Rest and be present. So one of the... The unforced oh. rhythms of grace. Right, that's, that's the way that it's, Eugene Peterson describes that in the message, the unforced rhythms of grace. That's what we're about to learn a little bit more about and be present in. Yeah. Does that mean I can talk now? You can. Okay. <laughs> Go, babe. So uh, Christy is going to be talking about rest and Sabbath. And um, one of the things we shared in our email that we sent out last night is that... Um, is that we are taking a four-week sabbatical starting Monday. Um, I have, we, 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 we goose, yeah. So we have been in ministry now uh, for 22, 23 years. It's been a lot of, been a lot of years. And uh, we've never had any sort of planned sabbatical time. And so one of the things we're going to do is we're going to take the next four weeks and really unplug from everything as it relates to both churches. So even our sister church uh, in Larkspur as well, we're unplugging from both places. And um, we have such a great team of people that we know they can navigate anything. They, they worked out a place for us to move to the week we were supposed to be on vacation. So you know, they, they can do anything. Um, it's a great team of people. And one of the things we've been working on is this idea of team. But I will tell you for Christy and I, um, this has been one of those places where we're trying to figure out how to even create better rhythms for our own life and also better rhythms for even our team. How do we make sure that we are having consistent rhythms? And um, I just will share with you, I, was, I had somebody ask me uh, uh, at pastor's prayer this past week what my hope was out of that. And I said, well, I have lots of different things I'm hoping for out of it, but I'm actually hoping that I will enter into a new rhythm, a new practice of a daily, of a daily walk with the Lord. My daily devotional time has become stale, and I'm actually looking forward to creating some new rhythms in this next four weeks. And so, um, anyhow, so you can be praying for us as we're taking some time off, um, and we... Yeah, so I just want to share, too, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with sabbatical, but sabbatical is not vacation. There, there can be components of things that feel like that, like fun and rest and um, that sort of thing. But sabbatical for us, we're kind of beta <laughs> testing for our whole team. <coughs> Life in ministry is difficult. I don't know if you know that. For our whole team, we want to know how do we help to continue to be filled as leaders in the church <coughs> by the Lord, right? So we're going to spend the next four weeks. I want to tell you, it's also not Lord of the Flies, okay? Our team is not like, where'd they go? Like, what has happened? Which I think is important to know. You guys actually probably will hardly miss us. Um, we'll continue in our ongoing teaching schedule, things that we do. Um, but this, these are the four things you can be praying. These are kind of the four phases as we've worked with our leadership coach and, and made our plans are um, to rest, to have time of reflection, to re-energize. That's where maybe some of the fun comes in. And, um, and to re-envision. What is the Lord speaking for this new season? What's coming? So we're really excited. We'll actually send you guys a couple video, like throughout the time we're gone, we'll send you a video each week and remind you what we're really pressing into that week so you can be praying with us. We want you guys to be a part of this too, and we're excited about the story of what the Lord has for, our, for us, um, but for our church as well. So we invite you guys into that too. So we're excited. And if it is Lord of the Flies, look at one another and be like, knock it off, okay? Just saying. It shouldn't be, though. <laughs> okay. We put Evan in charge, by the way. That's right. The youth he's got charge. it. Yeah, he's got it. He's got it. Yeah. He's fine. <clears throat> so uh, we talked earlier about discipline and, and that sometimes we want to run away from that word because it's become used so much to beat people up. But discipleship does require some level of discipline. There are places where you have to commit to try something. Most, uh, most experts will tell you it takes you about six weeks to create a new habit. 
You have to do something for six weeks before it becomes habit forming and becomes a part of your habit. But here's the good news. What, from a, neuro, like a neuroscience standpoint, do you know how long you have to be present to something to begin to build new neural pathways in your brain? Take a guess in your mind, or you can shout it out, I don't care. It's not six weeks. S 17 seconds. If you can <clears throat> remain present to something for 17 seconds, your brain begins to rewire and create new neural pathways that will allow you to engage with something and come back to it again. So if you can do 17 seconds in something new, it's a start. Yeah. And then you're going to be able to do 19 seconds, and then maybe 19 minutes, and then, right, like whatever it is that you're invited into. So when we can remain present, even in the places of resistance, the Lord is actively working and building something new within us, even when it doesn't feel like it. Yeah. So Henri Nouwen, in his book, Spiritual Formation, says, whereas discipline without discipleship leads to rigid, form, rigid uh, formalism, discipleship without discipline ends in sentimental romanticism. So there's, there's, it doesn't work either way. There's yeah. a place, there's a give and take both ways. And the challenge is, is if you find yourself moving too far away, too far towards discipline, and, and then you start making everybody else around you miserable because they're not doing all the practices the same way you're doing, you're probably going too far. Let's, uh, let's think that through. But, uh, but the challenge is, is how do we then allow ourselves to, to find the places where we are being invited into? So we would encourage you to try some new things. And pray about it. Like, which one serves? And here's what I would say is oftentimes the one you go, anything but that one, Lord, that's the one he's going to give you. Okay? Yeah. So yeah. just. So if know. you already had like a little prickling, where is God? He's, you guys are very resistant to this. <clears throat> he's in the resistance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I want to go back real quick to this quote uh, by Robert Mulholland. And he says that our cross is the point of our unlikeness to the image of Christ, where we must die to self in order to be raised to God into the wholeness of life in the image of Christ. So the process of being conformed to the image of Christ takes place right there at the point of our unlikeness to Christ. So do not fear. Do not run our cross, our point of the most unlikeness is where he begins our journey of transformation. So if you are joining us online, now's a great time to grab some communion elements. If you're in the room, if you do not have communion elements, if you would grab those. And if somebody wants to be so kind as to bring Christy and I communion elements, that would be super helpful as well. And You can um, also just raise your hand. Someone on our team throw will. them to us if you want oh, to. Thanks, oh, ben. thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. Can someone replace theirs for us? <laughs> and as we are headed into communion, I want to read this last little quote from Henri Nouwen. and I think it's beautiful. And I want to, uh, as you think about this kind of piece of it, he says, spiritual formation prepares us for a life in which we move away from our fears. I want you to hear this. We move away from our fears, compulsions, resentments, and sorrows to serve with joy and courage in the world. Even when this leads us to places we would rather not go, spiritual formation helps us see the face of God in the midst of a hardened world in our own heart. So our prayer and desire for you is that you would see this as an invitation into life abundant. Invitation. And this picture of rather than feeling this like weight that it would actually be this excitement to what might God want to do? Maybe he wants to do something really different in these next few weeks. And so we want to encourage you as we lean into that, be willing to lean into that thought of, God, what would happen if you want to do something really different and really interesting, maybe a way we've never thought before, all right? Hey guys, Mike and Christy Colley here. We're the lead pastors at SHV, and we wanted to personally invite you to join us in person on Saturday nights for service at 5 p.m., worship and community. You know, there's a special thing about actually being with other people yeah. in the room and learning what life with God looks like. And the SHV community is full of incredible people from different backgrounds, and we're all learning how to follow Jesus together. 
Yeah, so whatever your story, whatever your history, whatever your dreams for the future, you have a place at the table here at SHV. Yeah, and we would love to get the chance to know you better. And not just we in a, in a large sense, but for Christy and I, we would love to get to know you. So if you are around on a Saturday and it's your first time in person, please come say hello to us. We'd love to have a chance to meet you. Yeah, and remember, you are not alone. Mm -hmm. We are all better together. And we hope to see you soon on Saturday nights. Yeah. God bless. Have a great week. And hopefully we'll see you soon on a Saturday.